All right, good morning, church. If you don't know me, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. My name is Harold, and they let me do the preaching around here most of the time, so I'm grateful for that. And this here is Miley. Miley is just over two months old. She was two months old on Friday, and she was sleeping, but I had to wake her up for this, so I'm sorry. She wasn't quite asleep. Okay. Well, the reason I brought Miley up here, not just to show off and be a proud daddy, is, you know, two months old, I've heard this saying, and it's starting to become true, they grow up fast, don't they? A lot happened when she was about a month old, you know, a lot of leaps changed, and then two months old, man, she's grabbing our fingers and smiling and staring at things as you move them around, and they grow up fast. The saying is definitely true, and things are replaced every day. Why? Because she's growing, and I know it's a joke The parents say, you know, we want them to stay little forever, but we don't actually want that, do we? No, we don't want them to stay little forever. Two months old is not nearly the incredible life that she's going to have as she grows up more and more every year. And so I look at my little two-month-old Miley, and I see her, and I wonder how incredible she's going to be when she's the age of Sienna, just a few months older than her. Or maybe the age when she's as old as Gemma, just a couple years older than her. Or maybe Samantha, quite a few years older than her. Or you, you're right, I skipped you. My bad, my bad. Or maybe we'll go a long ways, all the way up to Addie. See, you're not a girl, I'm using girl references here. All the way up to Addie in high school, or all the way to maybe even McKinsey, who's going to college next week. It's crazy, but we really, as parents, And as people that care about kids, we want to see them growing up. We really don't wish that they will stay little forever. We want to see them change and become bigger and stronger and have more knowledge. Why? Because growth is a good thing, isn't it? Growth is an incredible thing. And so, here you go, Kim. You can have my beautiful little daughter back. I think I could do a whole sermon with her in my arms, but I'm not going to try it. Growth is a good thing, and so today we've got one final sermon out of the We the Church series. Uh, Next week, like I said, Clyde is going to be here from EEM after that, the first Sunday of August. Larry's got a sermon that he's rearing and ready to do. But today, for our very last We the Church, I want to talk about how we the church grow. We, the church, are called to grow, and I'm going to hit it in two different ways today. And like I said in Bible class, honestly, this could have been two sermons and probably should have been, but I only have one Sunday left before I'm gone for two weeks. So get ready. Here we go. If, uh, if you aren't already, I invite you to follow along, maybe take notes, because I do have a bunch of scripture today. Or if you're following along in the Bible app, that's a great place to save it and keep all these scriptures. I want you to do that so you can... Double check me, prove me right or wrong, and not just take my word for it, but examine the word of God as we talk about this last thing that we, the church, do, we grow. If you haven't been here for this sermon series or you don't remember, this this series has been about the idea that church is not a place you go to, church is not only the assembly, but rather it is us as people. So if we are going to be the called out, the saints, the Christians, we, like we the people, We the church. We the church. And so we can see two things that I've kind of pointed out in this series. What we are as we the church, the bride of Christ in the body, and then what we are to do, what we are called to do. We are called to bear one another's burdens. We are called to live at peace. We are called to grow. And so today, that's our our last one, one of the last callings that we have. We are called to grow. Let me take you through some scriptures about how we are called to grow, and I want to start off with what we started with over on the front of our bulletin this morning. It's in 2 Peter 3, verses 17 and 18. We just had verse 18 on the bulletin, but let me give you a little more context, just a little bit, not enough, but a little bit to see what we're talking about this morning. 2 Peter 3, verses 17 and 18. I'm reading out of the ESV, all of my verses out of the ESV this morning says, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with error 
of lawless people and you lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. See, verse 17 is really important to put with this verse because verse 18 starts with a but, right? So we got to know what the but is, what the but is from. Uh, say that too many times, it's going to be weird. But what is the but from, okay? The but is from living in error, being distracted, carried away with the error of lawless people so you lose your stability. The picture of stability is so important because everybody wants stability, whether it's in you know, your financial life or your home, you want your house built on a foundation that's stable, or maybe you're going on a hike and you don't want to be on slippery rocks. You want stability. We can all understand that. But the point is, is we cannot be distracted by human ways. See, the, the lawless people, that's, oh, that's powerful. What I'm going to talk about today is the human ways. That's the lawless people. But instead, we need to grow. Grow into what? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like I said last week, talking about walking in the light, one of our calls as Christians, we've got to focus on the right thing, keep the priorities straight, right? So here, we cannot try and live by the human ways, but rather we must grow, grow in Jesus Christ. It seems like, expanding on what Peter's saying here in 2 Peter, it seems like we are not to be consumed by the error of humans, but rather consume our lives with growing into more like Christ. Focus on Jesus. It's all linking back to what we talked about last week. And I think Peter also supported this idea back in 1 Peter as well. So if you want two Peter verses, here you go. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to give you five verses here, one through five. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, here Peter actually digs in a little bit deeper into those human error ways, right? Malice and deceit and hypocrisy, envy and slander. All of those things are human things. You ever thought about that? Humans are the ones that are jealous. Humans are the ones that talk bad about other people. Humans are the ones that are deceitful and have malice. Those are all human things. But instead of doing those human things, we should be longing to grow. He gives us this picture that we see. We're going to talk, touch on it multiple times to this, this morning. But this picture of spiritual milk. This picture of spiritual milk, right? Here it says, long for the spiritual milk, for pure spiritual milk. But it doesn't stop there. And that's what we're going to focus on today. It doesn't stop there. It says that by it you may grow up in salvation. See, it doesn't just say, have the spiritual milk and oh, be filled and warm. It says, have the spiritual milk so that you grow. So that you grow. You should be longing to grow. And the milk is a catalyst to take you further down the path of growth. And you can grow into your salvation. You should be growing into Jesus Christ. Christ, who was the living stone, who was rejected. All of these things coming together so that you too can be a living stone in this thing called we the church. We the church, a holy priesthood is what Peter says. Oh, that's good. All of this is pointing to the fact that us saints, us church, we're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be growing. And I, I like the idea of milk because Miley was just up here. We understand babies have milk, but they should grow. And they won't always stay there. And so we're going to talk about milk a couple more times today. But the reason I, I really feel like this needed to be the last sermon of We the Church is because as your preacher, as your minister, a big part of my job is to challenge us to grow. 
right? If I'm missing out on that, I'm missing out on my accountability to my role in God's eyes. And I see Paul exactly telling the church his conviction of God, too, when he talks about this, right? Uh, Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 together. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. I'll give you a second to get there because I need to get there too. All right, let's pick up there in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part of us is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You guys recognize that verse? Uh, Yeah, it was in Ephesians that you spent a whole two, three months talking about Harold. It was also like two weeks ago when we talked about the body of Christ, right? He is the head. We all have a function, all serving the complete unified body with Christ the head. But did you notice, I'm going to try and point something out differently here, is Paul starts off with who God gave. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? So they can equip the church. Why? So they can help the church to grow up to mature manhood. So I'm telling you right now, my conviction of what God is calling me to do is to be someone who can equip the saints. Equip the saints, and that's what I'm going to do every week, as long as, as long as I have the power, the ability, and God's spirit flowing through me. But the thing that I need to equip the saints here in Ephesians chapter 4 is to grow into mature manhood. It's said multiple different ways, multiple times here in just Ephesians 4, um, to mature manhood so that you're no longer acting or may no longer be children, but rather you can grow into Christ. In other words, part of the calling for me to give to you guys is that we are to grow. We are to grow. Just like Miley, we should not be scared by growth, but rather excited by growth. Everybody still want to be a baby? (laughs) Thank you. Here's the thing. I was a fantastic baby. And by what I... (laughs) Some people already know this. And what I mean by fantastic is I screamed for two years straight, right? Two years straight. Did you want me to stay a baby forever? No. They're so grateful that I stopped screaming at them, and now I'm grown up, and I scream at other people for a living. (laughs) We are called to grow, and it is my conviction, my calling from God to spur us to growth so that we are no longer tossed to and fro like with human cunning like children but rather we can grow to mature manhood as Christians. So what I want to focus on first is that each and every one of us as Christians, we are called to grow personally, personally. Uh, Harold's not discluded from that in case you were wondering. Each and every one of us as saints is called to grow in our faith journey with Christ being the head. So that's why I got this passion for this last message is because I see not only something we are to do together, but something I must challenge us to do together. We must grow. Paul writes the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians. We've talked about 1 Corinthians a lot here the past few weeks because 1 Corinthians, you know, the church in Corinth, they are kind of a mess, right? And this church that Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians, Paul loves them. This is the church that he helped establish. If we want to use a modern term, he planted this body. And he's been gone, and he's writing them letters, seeing where they're at now. And man, 1 Corinthians, it's tough. It's tough because they're lacking growth. They haven't grown yet. Let's let's read it before I talk about the whole thing. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. But I, brothers... 
could not address you as spiritual people, but as people as the flesh, as infants in Christ. I feed you with milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving in only a human way? The disappointment that's dripping from these few sentences. Paul, he knows these brothers and sisters. He planted this church. He loves them. And he has to write them. And he says, when I was first here, I gave you spiritual milk because you were brand new. That's right. But even now, I can't feed you solid food. That's disappointing. The disappointment is there has been no growth. In fact, maybe even there's been backsliding because they're living in such a human way. He can't even speak to them as if they're saints. He's speaking to them as if they're only flesh. These so-called Christians, that's what I read Paul saying here, a little feisty, right? You so-called Christians haven't grown in your faith at all. And it's got to be heartbreaking. The Hebrew author experienced the disappointment as well. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, if you want to flip there with me. All right, Hebrews 5, starting in verse 11. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've all become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's like a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And the disappointment, right? See, spiritual milk is what we begin on, but we are called to grow to meteor things. And I'll tell you what, here in Wyoming, we like our meteor things on the dinner plate, but do we like them in our assemblies? Do we like them with the saints? Do we want them in church, or do we just want to be on milk? See, the call is to be growing in maturity, and the call for me is to call us to grow in maturity, because I... Don't think Paul or the Hebrew author wanted to write those disappointing words. But rather, they wanted to write a church, a people that had grown and made them so proud, which we see that happening in Scripture too. It's just not those two examples, the disappointment. Why is it so easy to not grow? Because growing is hard. And don't get it twisted here. If you hear this sermon and think I'm saying uh, growth will be easy or it won't have challenges, that's the opposite of what I'm saying. Growth will have its challenges. That's a guarantee. Matthew chapter 10, we read this two weeks ago, Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, talking about a challenge that we will have if we grow in our faith. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The words of Jesus himself. And he says that multiple times. Oh, just two chapters later. Or six chapters later, I can count. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? It's also in Mark chapter 8, that that exact piece of scripture. What about in Luke? We'll give you one more of the gospels. Luke 14, 26 and 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Man, don't give that as a sermon on its own. 
That is only the challenges and the struggles that we will have to endure if we are going to grow in Christ. And they're big. Who are you going to have to deny? Your mom and dad, your brother and sister, your spouse, your teammate, even your own life. You will have to deny as you pick up your cross and grow in your faith with, with Christ. If that doesn't paint the picture that there will indeed be challenges, um, I guess you guys don't like your families in your own life because there will be challenges. See, that's the calling that we have, and it's in very physical terms, isn't it? Things we can understand, we understand having to separate ourselves from family and from loved ones in order to serve Jesus. And it's going to be because we're growing. We understand the physical terms of growth. Miley's not there yet, but you get some of those middle school kids, you know, they go to bed, and in the middle of the night, their legs are killing them. They've got, we call it a Charlie horse, right? I don't know if that's the right term or not. They're growing, and so their legs are literally expanding, and they hurt. Growth hurts. Growth is a challenge. Growth may bring pain. But you want to see that kid grow, don't you? You want to see him get taller. You want to see them grow. And the reason that we may go through the challenge and the hard things is because, man, we will be praised for our growth. I didn't want to give it away yet, but let's look. Praised for our growth. Church in Thessalonica, Paul again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the inflictions that you are enduring. See, I chose this verse specifically because it talks about all the things we've already talked about. There is no disappointment in this one. There is praise. But there is challenges that they've gone through, growing pains, persecution. We can't even understand that really as, American, as Americans. Persecutions and afflictions that they not only endured but are currently enduring. Why? Because they are growing and the answer to that is, praise God, I'm going to tell the rest of the churches because you make me proud. Tell you what, if I get to pick one, and it's not Paul saying this, but God saying this, I don't want to pick, I'm so disappointed that you can't eat meat yet. I'd rather pick God telling me at the end of my days, well done, good and faithful servant. Because I continued to grow individually, individually. Why should we grow individually? Because God, his desire is to rejoice in the salvation of every person. You remember last week when we talked about walking in the light? I love that picture because walking has to be active. Because if you stop walking, you start doing something else. It's called standing or sitting or sleeping or whatever. You can't be walking unless you're walking. I'm going to say the same picture should apply to our growth, right? While we are walking in the light, we're not stopping because we're growing. And if we are stopping, we're not growing. We're not growing. We're staying the same. And that's when Paul would say, oh, you're still on spiritual milk. I want God to say to me, well done. And God loves it when he gets one more saved. You probably know this verse by heart, at least I hope so. Luke 15:10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one, one sinner who repents. Who's not worth it? Nobody. One. The picture I get when I read Luke 15, 10 here is heaven singing and rejoicing every time there's one more. How cool is that? Angelic song. I mean, we get these pictures of angelic song in heaven. That's what's happening every time someone repents. One more sinner who became a saint. One more who becomes a member of the body of the church. One more who is saved. One sinner who repents. One heavenly party because of one sinner who repents. That's what God and the angels rejoice in. That's what they scream, shout, and sing about. And do you know? I hope you know. I hope this isn't brand new for you. We as the church, 
we as Christians, we get to have a part in making God and the angels rejoice because we are ambassadors of the mission of God. 2 Corinthians 5.20, if you've never heard that term before, we don't use this very often, that we are ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The part I really want to point out there is we are ambassadors for Christ, living out the examples where we are making God's appeal. Whoa. In other words, the way that we live our lives, the way that we have grown, is actually our mission tool. It's how we radiate Christ and how we point people to God. We get to be a part of this rejoicing in heaven. Why? Because we can bring people to Christ ourselves. We can share the gospel message. In fact, I think we're called to be a catalyst for the growth of the church. This is the second piece I want to talk about today. We are called to grow, but I think we're also called to be a catalyst for the growth of the church, and the church is called to grow. You know a bunch of these, but I'm going to power through them. I hope you know them by heart. We're called to be a catalyst for church growth. Check this out. Matthew 4, verse 19. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Was he just talking to Simon and Andrew? That's who he was talking to. No, he's, this is a message for everyone that follows him, isn't it? Follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. I will make you an ambassador on my behalf. I will let you grow so the church can grow. And I will send you. I will send you out. Acts chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Verse 8 in Acts chapter 1. Was this just for, for the small group that he was talking to? Well, I don't think so because he says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, they could all hit those places. But through the end of the earth, that's going to require more than just the small crowd he's talking to, isn't it? This is a call for us. We are called to be fishers of men and we are called to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Why don't you start where you're at? That's where I'm going to start. Because we are called to go make disciples. Hopefully this one's definitely by heart. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This isn't just a call for preachers. Preachers are supposed to baptize people, right? This is a call for all of us to make disciples of who? Everybody, all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. And he's with us to the end of the age. Mark 16, 15 and 16, he said to them, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We like to hang on the last part there. Believe, be baptized, be saved, and won't be damned. What about for us? Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. All y'all, go. Grow the church. Go and grow the church. Jesus told us in his own words while speaking to the disciples and to the apostles that this sainthood, this church, these followers of him, we from generation to generation are going to have to be laborers for his harvest. He even says laborers. I love that. Matthew chapter 9, 35 through 38. Sorry, that's pretty small for you. I hope you can read it. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus saw the crowd. 
he saw all of these people. People lost. People without a savior like sheep without a shepherd. Taking us all the way back to our sheep series. Sheep without a shepherd, wandering, ready to die because they're too dumb to do it alone. And Jesus says, his heart is pricked, and he says, the harvest is plentiful. That's all the people. But the laborers are few. So if we are the laborers, we are the church, we are the saints the called out, we have the call to be the laborers in the harvest. It's already God's harvest anyways. We're kind of scared just to go invite people to church. Inviting people to church may be all they need because God's already worked on their heart. We don't know. Are we ready to be laborers in his harvest? I think the scripture is calling us to be. It's calling us to grow ourselves and to grow the church, collective, the body of Christ. And you know what? The New Testament church, that first century church, they got it. And they did it. Day by day, in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. It's almost like it took them a minute to realize what Jesus said about the laborers. But when the New Testament church got started, after Peter gave them the kick in the pants they needed to get out there and be the church, it's like they were like, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Let's be the laborers. And they did it. In fact, they grew the church. I love the book of Acts. And if it was my, my thing, it'd be every other sermon series, we'd be back in the book of Acts, but trying to leave room for the rest of the word of God. I love the book of Acts. And I want to point out something really specific to you in the book of Acts about growing. Acts chapter 1. That's when Peter gives them the kick in the pants they need, Acts 1.15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. Right before Pentecost there, 120 people, okay? Brenda pointed out that there was 500 people um, when Jesus was back for 40 days. Either way, we're at a couple hundred people. That's where we're starting after Jesus has uh, been crucified, buried, and resurrected. This is where we're starting is 120, 500, couple hundred people. But check out what happens quickly. Acts 2.41, that's the next chapter, in case you didn't notice. So those who received the word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I don't know if anybody's ever going to write this church's book or my story but I kind of doubt that so far I go from chapter 1 to chapter 2 and gain 3,000 people. The book of Acts does. The first century church did. And people like to talk about growth, and they're really scared to talk about numbers. But you know what? The book of Acts is full of numbers. And it's full of growth numbers. Acts 2.41, they have 3,000 added Acts 2.47, six verses later, more are added. Praising God and having favor with all people, the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Okay, Acts chapter 4. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000 men. Not women and children, men. This is the same church that just started in the, in the very end of Luke, the beginning of Acts chapter 1. Okay? 5,000 people, chapter 5, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Acts chapter 6, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because the widows were being neglected in their daily distribution. A little bit of growing pains, you know what they do? They take care of it because they're increasing in number. They're growing the church. They say, we're preaching, somebody else needs to do that, pick them. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Then on to Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. We're talking about the Pharisees in John at the, in our class time. Yeah, we're getting some of those type of people. The priests became obedient to the faith. 
all the way to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. (sighs) Breathe with me for a second. Wow. The church grew. All but the last verse we read too, by the way, that was in one city, Jerusalem. And they stopped counting at 5,000 men because 5,000 men is a lot to count. And then they just said, it grew, it multiplied greatly. And now here we are in the region in Acts chapter 9. And yet again, by the Lord and the Holy Spirit, it has multiplied. Whew. We need to grow personally if we're going to be saints. But we also need to grow the church, don't we? Are you happy where we're at? No, hopefully not, because the church is called to grow. And it's called to grow by numbers. Look at what happened in the book of Acts. How many thousands of people? And so I got this crazy idea. Do you want to grow? Because I got a crazy idea. And you might not like it, but I'm sticking to it. Sometimes you just got to own it, even if it's wrong, even if it's bad. I got this crazy idea, and I'm calling it 126 by 126, making disciples in Riverton, Wyoming. If you pay attention, you've probably noticed that we've actually had pretty good attendance here at church lately. We've been in the mid-60s pretty regular, and that's growth. You know, that's about 20 extra people since I started. Started preaching here. It's pretty cool. That's growth. But conveniently enough, yeah, we had 63 people last week. Right there. It just worked perfectly for this. 63 people last week. My challenge is, is can we double that? 126? Sure we can. 63 people, every person brings one more person. That's 126. Yes, 60. 63 today? Oh my goodness. 63 people, if we all brought one more person, that would be 126 people. Well, you're like, I got kids. Kids. If your family can bring another family, we will double in size. Can we double our congregation, our Sunday morning number in a year and a half? Can we have 126 by 126? Of course we can. Are you ready to grow? Are we willing to grow? Because it's not about the number. Numbers, Dan, you're fine. Numbers are a good metric. Look at the book of Acts. Numbers, they grew, they multiplied. 3,000, 5,000, multiplied, multiplied. Numbers are a good metric. But it's not about the numbers, is it? If we double in size, I guarantee I guarantee that people will hear the gospel message because I will give it. If we double in size Sunday morning attendance, I guarantee people will be challenged to walk with Jesus. People will be baptized. People will be saved. And the church will grow, not just by numbers, but by souls. Oh, yeah, and you remember how God feels about souls? Him and the angels rejoice in heaven, and he's ready to rejoice in one more but it's going to take us being ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. It's going to take us growing ourselves as Christians and then deliberately growing the church. And if you ain't done growing yet, welcome to the club. Because we as a church ain't done growing yet either. And we should be bringing others into eternity with us just like the church in Acts did, just like the church in the first century did. And if we can do what the church in the first century did, 126 by 126 is nothing. It is absolutely nothing. One more person for every single one of us, it's nothing, but it's everything to 63 souls. And it will be hard, and we won't fit in this room anymore, praise God. So what I'm telling you is I'm planning not to fit in this room in 2026, okay? So get ready to start digging that way. 
63 souls. 126 by 126. It's a crazy idea, but I'm telling you this not as a metaphor. I'm going to talk about it all year. You know, you might be like, ah, oh, Harold forgot about that crazy thing, and then it's going to pop back up. Because can we double? Because 63 souls are 63 rejoices to God and the angels in heaven, and it's worth it. And even if we fail, one more soul is going to make God smile. So let's grow. You ready? It's going to be hard. Let's grow. Dustin, let's sing this last song.